Number one, invest in leadership sooner, right? So invest in leadership then. There's some lessons I learned along the way that life is going to teach you. And there's, I, I don't detract from the experience. Like it is a journey. You want the experience, but focus on it and invest in it sooner would have been a, one of those things. You know, as I look back, I was exposed to things like Stephen Covey and other things along the way that I didn't recognize the importance of. It's not that I disregarded it, but I didn't esteem it with the value that I could have. Welcome to the Leaders in Tech podcast. I have created this venue to honor the leaders in technology that, is, that are changing their communities, are changing the people they work with, for a better place to create more abundance, more value through technology and through leadership inside technology. It was crazy that when I started this podcast, I realized there was nothing dedicated to leadership in technology, only technology-based podcast, but nothing that talked about the people that made it happen. And that's why I opened up this channel. Today we have with us one of those exceptional leaders, Nathaniel, welcome to the show. Thanks, nice to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful. Nathaniel, for the audience, can you tell me your full name? Where do you live and what do you do for a living? Sure. So my name is Nathaniel Morris and I'm located in East Tennessee, so in the beautiful Smoky Mountains, one of the most visited national parks in the United States. And then I, as a, uh, what I do for a living, I work with technology leaders and business owners to help them get better value out of their technology. I work for a firm that I founded called EQ Digital. EQ Digital. So let's go deeper into that. What do you guys do for, like, how do you add value to your clients? Absolutely. So. What normally happens is we get brought in to help an organization who is struggling with their technology team. That could be one of two things. Either they are going through a large amount of growth, and so they're trying to scale their technology organization because their business is extremely successful and they need to get to the next level and they're looking for experience so that they can avoid the short, uh, avoid the pitfalls and get a shortcut where they don't have to kind of go through the hard knocks and the experience of learning the hard way. And so we're able to help guide them through the right decisions. The other is when they're having a difficulty with their technology. Maybe they've had a leader that's been there for a while and they've left to another opportunity. And so a business is struggling with how do we scale or they've been in a situation where um, perhaps the organization has gone through multiple ownership changes, those type of things. So typically it's an organization that is looking to make a better value out of their tech and they're struggling a little bit. Where we come in and where we add value is we've been in tech or technology organizations. And most importantly, it's not that we just know the tech, but we understand how business works. And so we sit down with the business leaders and understand what are you trying to accomplish? What's not working? And we bridge the gap between the two organizations, between tech and business. And those are really different disciplines. And we help each side understand what the other is trying to accomplish get the alignment, we like to say create harmony between business and tech, and that allows the organization to meet their goals. That's beautiful, you know, that's one of the hardest tasks uh, in technology. One of the reasons why I grew up so much in the corporate environment when I started working is because my mentors realized that I had this God-giving ability where I could speak tech, but mm -hmm. I could also speak business. Mm -hmm. And having the persons with that bridge, they are not very, many right like if you're highly a highly skilled technology person you tend to be introverted and you just want to write code or go to your uh, networking cabling system and and just do your job and if you're a business person a very successful business person you tend not to know anything about technology but yeah. you nathaniel you have both and that's you know that's a beautiful skill to have and one of the things i will tell you is that you will never have trouble uh, making making your your payroll and, and you know creating more value <laughs> There, there are a lot of companies that are struggling and while we enjoy helping, there always seems to be more. So you're right, there's there's a lot of opportunity out there. You know, I, one of the places that, you know, so I run a software technology company, we just build custom apps for, for clients. And, but one of these, I remember in 2008, 2009, um, somebody suggested us to go to help this big, big company, a billion dollar company. And they, they had like 300 developers and, and uh, they were building video games. But the owner, the founder of the company was not a game, com game company, it was not a tech company. They were actually the largest importers of uh, gift, gift items for, for retail shops in Canada and the USA. And they stumbled into making this game and the game became 
popular. They made $700 million in net profits without gain in two years. Uh, but they didn't know what they were doing. So they grew, they scaled. They, now their IT team looked as big as the other departments that they had. And they didn't know how to treat people. They didn't know how to actually get them to get them to collaborate. They, they looked at them as factory workers. Yeah. And of course, everything was failing. They were losing millions of dollars. And then they appointed me to be that bridge. It was the hardest job that I ever done in technology because it required, required a lot of leadership, a lot of understanding, and putting the right persons in place to make that bridge. Because eventually, after two years, I left, right? I left, it was just one of our clients and I had 10 other clients. But it really shook me to my core to realize how despair those departments could become, IT versus business, right? Yeah, and if they're not, if there's not a deliberate focus inside of a business to maintain that alignment, and if it's not built into the DNA, they're going to grow apart. And the further they grow apart, the worse it hurts the business. And so you're describing where they just grew apart and no one was focused on creating that alignment. And it's a lot of pain and it takes a lot of work to get it back together. <laughs> Nathaniel, how did you acquire these amazing leadership skills in IT? Let's look back, let's look back at your life. Mm -hmm. Did you go to university? What do you what do you do right after high school? So I was intending to go into uh, education. And so that this would have been back in the late 90s. And so I was looking at going into the world of teaching in math and in science. And then I decided that I, there was this thing called, you know, computers and e-commerce. And I started working with a company who was just into some of the early e-commerce, uh, you know, e-commerce itself, dot-com bubble. You know, we're kind of on the back end of some of that as the later stages. And I was working with a company and helping them just as while I was in college and I got off into the tech track and wound up going that path. So I'm self-taught uh, along the way with a lot of mentorship uh, from various individuals. And But I taught myself coding, taught myself networking uh, along the way. Uh, but I grew up on the e-commerce side where business and tech are really, it's the intersection of the two. So we had to understand the customer experience as well as how the tech worked. And that hybrid and working together with other leaders and great business uh, leaders and then great tech leaders, I kind of sat in the middle in those conversations and I began to realize that neither of them really understood the other side. And from early in my career, it began to be something that I would bridge that gap. And as it went along, we would learn more tech and we'd have higher level conversations. We'd learn more as we sat down with chief financial officers and CEOs, and we began to understand how to bridge that more and more. And so it's just been something from the beginning that has turned into a career. So did you jump, jump right into business or did you have a, a job in technology? Like how did you land into technology after you taught yourself all that? By the yeah. way, congratulations. I have two computer science degrees. Like I went to school for a long time to know what I know. And when I actually, when I got out, I realized I, I didn't know anything. I actually had to keep learning to, to do in my jobs. You know, like the first job that I had, they required five programming languages that I didn't know. The five that I knew, they were not using there. And they still took a risk on me. And uh, you know, six months later, I was an expert in all of them. Yeah. And I just, it just shook me to the core because I thought, oh, I finished college. I'm just gonna start writing the languages that I learned. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, and when I was into e-commerce, there weren't even degrees in e-commerce, right? So it was a new thing at the time. But the world that I started in and where we kind of walked into it is I came in from the analytics side. So I began working with the data as the before I was even doing coding. And I began working with the data and understanding how the e-commerce business was working and how uh, the beauty of retail online is we get to measure far more than a brick and mortar does, at least back in the day. And so we began to work with the web analytics tools and the data tools and the point of sale systems. And all of that began to be the first part of the conversation. And of course, I had to explain the data to the business and say, well, this is what this means. And I would sit down with business owners who are saying, well, we understand the customer and the customer is doing X. And I would have to look at them and say, I'm not an expert in that, but I do know that the data says the customer is not doing X, <laughs> right? So here's more data and here's what we're showing. And so I began to learn how to have those conversations. And then from a tech perspective, uh, I stepped into a world of just teaching myself from the data tools 
how to write systems and coding and that type of thing to support data, customizing the tools, customizing the graphics, customizing, uh, you know, writing scripts and batch jobs and other things to begin to process data. And that's kind of where the seed of it began. Uh, I began to experiment with web technologies and writing, you know, the front end languages as well. And so over time, I wound up getting hired for some specific uh, application development, uh, wrote an entire process system for a local entrepreneur who said, hey, I need a system and I'm in a new industry. So we wrote him an application from the ground up with CRM and quoting and tools. And then as it went along, just kept being hungry, right? That's so important as you're talking about technology is changing so rapidly that even if you have a set of skills over two or three or four years, you're gonna have to learn new skills that are coming out. And so how do we stay hungry? And that became really important to me is to keep learning and have the conversations, sit down with people who are different technology than I may use and understand what they're doing and why and how it applies. Along the way, right, you just pick up more and more skills that you add to your knowledge base. And what I found in tech is it's not so much the specifics of a language or the specifics of a technique. It's more about a mindset and how you approach problem solving. It's how you actually understand how to apply this problem solving to the business and the needs of the customer. And then you can get into the details, but really understanding the strategy is so fundamental. That's incredible. Um, when was the first time that you encountered yourself that you needed to develop leadership skills? Because it wasn't no longer managing yourself, but you were responsible for other people. Which, by the way, that was the hardest decision for me uh, because I could never, my thought was I was so naive and so arrogant that I thought that nobody was a better coder than me. So it was very hard for me to delegate. I wanted to do it, and if I, were allowed, I was allowing somebody else decided to do it, I had to supervise and I had to micromanage it. It took a long time for me to become a leader like that. How about you? Tell me your experience. Yeah, so uh, leadership is a journey that I learned the hard way. Um, so a couple of milestones. The first one where I really began to understand this was, uh, and I don't, I'm not going to say I, I understood it after this, but it, it kind of was the first uh, road sign along the way. I had a review that came back from my team. Uh, and I had a very small team at the time. It was my first leadership role. And I got an annual review where, you know, they had done a 360 and the team provided some feedback. And I thought I was doing pretty good at relationships and having a conversation and um, words that I will never forget where they described me as a cold, emotionless robot. <laughs> and, you know, that's not because I thought, wow, I'm doing such a great job in helping this team. But I realized that my problem solving skills or the ability to work with a team to help them be better with their skills wasn't worth anything if I couldn't connect with the team, right? So that's one of the first lessons in leadership is how do you actually connect and gain the trust and the respect of the team, not just for what you know, but as a person and that you care about them. And, you know, the old saying, right? That they don't care what you know until they know how much you care. And so really that began the first point where I said, I've got to go beyond this. And that began a journey. And then along the way, I had another milestone later where I began working with a team that was much larger. So leading leaders and not just leading teams. And that was another inflection point because I began to work with leaders and I began to scale up and I thought, okay, I know how to lead people. This will be similar. And it's not. And, you know, there are some principles that are there, but teaching leaders how to lead is different than leading a specific team. And I wound up in a situation where I was working with a team and really I, the team basically mutinied on me and I didn't understand why. And that became another journey of self-discovery and really began to be a conversation of my tech skills are there, but I've really got to master this. And that was where I kind of made the decision. I wasn't in the business of just being a technician. I really wanted to lead. And so I had to work on myself harder than I'd ever done. And that became a journey of, you know, learning through books, learning through conferences, learning through other means where I really wanted to study leadership. And I still am, I'm still on the journey, right? Oh, I'm a perfect leader. So I'm still learning every day, 
but that was a conversation that was a real inflection point for me. And as I grew and I learned how to lead leaders, then that became part of the conversation of really learning how to then influence, not just as a direct line, but how to broaden influence. Because when you're leading leaders, it's about influence, it's not about direct control. And that really helped me in the boardroom because then you learn that as a senior technologist, your job is as much to lead sideways as it is to lead into your team. And that became part of the discovery as well. What, what has been the most important lesson that you learn on leading, leading leaders? Because that's, you're completely right, it's a completely different skill. Um, I actually, for me, I, when I, back in 20, 2013, I realized that, I remember December 27, 2012, I said, I am not a good leader, I need to do something. So you know what I did? I left, I left my VP of operations in charge of my company. And I took a year sabbatical. I was maybe working four hours, five hours a week. And I took a postgraduate degree in leadership, specifically for technology people. Mm-hmm. It was a one year course. Uh, I was going, I was going to Fort Lauderdale like, you know, every, every other month. And they had me read 32 books and all the exams were oral exams. Like we were 17 people in the class, all technology leaders that were horrible like me. <laughs> well, so I was probably the worst, but I had to actually give the exams. They will never make me write anything. It was, everything was oral, right? Uh, with three judges. And uh, the first thing that I learned is how to speak in public. It's one of the things that I did, didn't know. Actually, this is why I'm doing this now, because I, I got those skills back in 2014 when I went to, to this program in 2015. And uh, they started, it was beautiful because they started leading, learn, they, they taught me how to lead myself. Then. They taught me how to lead a group of 70. And then we went up to 80 people. And they, they talk about tribes and then how to start leading leaders. And so now I have the skills that, you know, if I needed to, I could lead organizations of thousands of people. But it actually, that course was a life change. And, and, uh, and when I came back, my company started to grow 50 to 20% per year just by changing my leadership skills. So what do you do? Like, what was the most important thing in your skill sets, especially to become a leader of leaders, because it's completely different than being just a leader of your pod, right? Yeah, absolutely it is. I, I think, you know, and, and I love your example there where the company's not going to grow above the leader, right? So you have to elevate yourself in order to be able to elevate the organization. And what I learned, I guess, the if I'm boiling it down to one of the most critical things as far as it, the different lessons are all important, but the thing that was really pivotal for me was understanding that leadership, I look at it as a sphere, right, a globe. And so there's different facets of leadership and every individual is going to have strengths and weaknesses in those facets. So someone might be really good at strategy and while another person is really good at connecting with people, while someone else is extremely good at operational tactics, whether it be tech or whether it be other types of tactics, there's different skills in leaders. And what's really important is to understand that I don't have to be the expert at all of them, nor do I have to make all of the leaders that I'm leading mirrors of me. One of the common issues that I see is, especially in tech leaders, is that they will try to make the next tier of leadership look just like them. And that's really detrimental to the team as well as the leader. And so you might say, okay, I'm really good at strategy. I need to make sure that I have someone who's really good at operations in the leadership. So because we are a leadership team, not individual leaders. And when you understand that, you ch- it changes how you hire, it changes how you coach, it changes everything about the organization. Because, for example, if I have a leader leave the team and go to another organization or another part of the business, then I need to understand the dynamic of the leaders around them to know what I'm really looking for. And it's not just, okay, someone with qualifications who's led a team. I need to know, are they a strategist? Are they uh, someone who's tactics? Are they someone who's really good at connecting with people? And really understanding that because I've had situations where I needed to to lean on somebody who might've technically reported to me, but they were better at a skill and I needed to let them handle this facet because 
that was their wheelhouse and they were really good at it. And helping them understand and develop those skills, giving space for them to fail even, and saying, I'm giving you responsibility, I'm here for you, and it's okay if we make mistakes as long as we're, as the adage goes, failing forward, right? We're learning and we're growing. So that understanding that it is about a team, it's not about me or making everyone in my image, that's really crucial, especially in the technical space. Beautiful, no, for sure. Um, tell me about your, your um, desire is to become an entrepreneur. I mean, when you are a leader in technology, uh, your life is pretty hard, but uh, the pay is pretty good. And uh, you have this sense of stability, especially if you work for mid-sized companies or, or Fortune 500 companies, larger companies. Yeah. Going into business is going, basically, when I went into business, uh, Nathaniel, I basically burned everything behind me so that I could never go back mm -hmm. and uh, just jump in the deep water. And, you know, I, I'm a born again Christian, so I just said, Jesus, if you, if, if, if I fail, please rescue me, because I didn't know. I, I had three kids, a wife, a mortgage, and I left a beautiful six-figure paying job with, you know, 25% bonus at the end of the year if the company did well and a month vacation. And I yeah. the next day I had zero income. How did it go for you? <laughs> so uh, I had stepped out into entrepreneurship before, uh, so it wasn't new to me, but I always had, well, not always, there was one segment in my career where I'd stepped out and I had a contract already lined up, I had everything lined up. And so I didn't go to zero, right, when I left the organization. But then I went back to full time. So to your point, I went back into full time. I had the stable income. I had a good job. Um, you know, all of the things that you just described. And in the end of 2019, uh, I began to grow restless. And, you know, it's one of those things where I really love solving problems. I am a student of business. Um, my dad ran his own business. My grandfather ran his own business. Uh, and so I have always been around entrepreneurs, always been around business, and I love business. So I was getting restless. I wanted to say, okay, this team was running very well. Um, the leadership team was really, really uh, humming. And I said, okay, I want to make a transition. So I went in January of 2020 to the executive that I reported to, and I said, okay, you know, I'm going to leave. Let's build a transition plan. And so I left the organization the week before the world shut down. I told him in January, but in March. <laughs> and so I stepped out and I had a couple of contracts I was expecting and the world shut down. And to your point, everything went to zero. And you say, OK, how do we go forward from here? And it's one of those situations where I am not afraid of a challenge. I'm not afraid of a little bit of chaos. Uh, and so we had to grind it out and 2020 was really hard. Um, but you know, we began to recover, we began to land some clients and we get, began to move forward, but I wouldn't trade the entrepreneurial journey because it's so fulfilling and so rewarding to be able to work with multiple clients, to understand their challenges, to help them solve the problems and really see businesses. You know, I love working for a single company in the sense that you really get to embed extremely deeply and it's a long journey. And when I've worked for a company, it's tended to be five plus years that I've been there. And so I've been really in there understanding the organization, building relationships. But the downside to that is you typically have that view. And so you don't get to see a little bit broader market and really that diversity of experience makes you a better individual it makes you a better leader and so i really push the envelope and um, my risk meter is calibrated differently than some because i'll i'll go into risk <laughs> and uh you know as a business owner i don't know how you could be otherwise so. yeah you're right uh, Nathaniel. actually becoming a leader in technology has a great risk because when you're just a developer or you're a network analyst hardware or software you're responsible to do your job and to do it very well and if you do that you'll be fine yeah but when you become a technology leader though you're responsible for everybody's performance and when you become a leader of leaders it gets even more but the next step the next step is becoming your own boss becoming an entrepreneur because now you're actually responsible for not only yourself and your leaders but for your clients too 
you're responsible for your employees. Yeah. And it's a, it's an honor to be in this position, by the way. It's an honor. Oh, and yeah. It's it, it, absolutely. It's not for everybody, right? Well, it's the highest form of service is I, the way I look at it, right? At the end of the day, if I'm able to support my team and my clients and really to serve them well, then it's an ability for me, you know, everyone that works with me, I'm changing their lives and in many cases, their livelihoods. And that's an honor to be able to make that impact to your point. And it's the highest form of service, you know, that servant leadership mindset. That's a great point, actually. I'm about to open a, I actually just opened a business, a new business. So I run multiple companies. Uh, I, I manage the art of delegation and co-creation. Co so I, I, I join other entrepreneurs and we have multiple businesses with other friends. Uh, but the business that I just, that I just started is called uh, Owners in Faith. And it's for companies, for business in companies, uh, leaders in companies that, you know, that are of faith. And uh, the whole theme of this thing is how do we teach ourselves how to be a servant leader? Because you're right, the best leader is the one that knows that they are there to serve others, to serve everybody. And it's the highest calling, like you said, right? It's beautiful. Now, Daniel, if you had a time machine, you will, you will go back in time when you were 25, 26 years old. What advice would you give yourself? So there's probably a couple of things that I would say. Uh, number one, invest in leadership sooner, right? So invest in leadership then. There's some lessons I learned along the way that life is gonna teach you. And there's, I, I don't detract from the experience. Like it is a journey, you want the experience, but focus on it and invest in it sooner would have been a, one of those things. You know, as I look back, I was exposed to things like Stephen Covey and other things along the way that I didn't recognize the importance of. It's not that I disregarded it, but I didn't esteem it with the value that I could have. So that would have been one of the lessons that I would have said early on. You know, the, the second one that I would probably have shared, uh, you know, from where I sit now and where it's there is, it's not about the problems that you're solving, right? So I solved a lot of tech problems through my career. We had a lot of issues, we had a lot of things, but when I left, the company, uh, one of my companies, my team put together a little memento book. And what they had done is they took and they handed out cards to a lot of different people that I'd worked with. And they, they wrote notes, right? I remember this about my experience working with Nathaniel. And that was compiled and handed to me. And to the last one, none of them were about the problems we solved. It was about the journey that we had along the way, the experiences we had together, the stories, those type of things. And so invest in leadership, understand leadership, how to work with leadership, but then also understand the journey and understand that those moments are going to be so impactful for people. And there were things that were written on cards that candidly I hadn't remembered, but wow. they had made a big impact on an individual. And sometimes it was, you know, I mean, one of them stands out where uh, somebody on my team said, hey, I came to Nathaniel, I asked for something personal and they had needed a specific time off for something and then asked for something. And, and I had responded just the way I did with everybody with a, we will cover it. This is family's more important. Take care of this, you know, whatever you need. And, and they had not worked with me a lot at that point and they were newer into my team. And that stuck with them to the point that years later when they were saying, what do I remember? that was a moment that they had remembered and that they chose to record. And again, that was a moment that was just day-to-day -day operations for me, but it made an impact on that individual's life. You know, it's about the relationships. It's about people. It doesn't matter how technical we become. I just wrote a book about AI, by the way, and the book became number one on Amazon like within 10 hours. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there was no more AI books. I wrote the first AI book. Can you believe it? There's well, another book on ChatGPT, but the, the history of AI and where we're going, I was the first, I couldn't believe it. Anyways, I'm saying that because I'm so focused in technology as well as leadership. But at the end of the day, Nathaniel, it's the human connections, it's the relationship, it's how do you help others to be better? How do you help others achieve what they want? So that what you want is going to be automatically given to you, isn't it? And I will tell you, to that point, right, speaking to a 25-year-old self, 
there's the regrets in my career are not regrets on technical decisions. The regrets on relationships that were damaged. Mm. You know, remember when I told you that I bought all the bridges when I started my business? Yeah. I regret it later yeah. because uh, I was working for a Fortune 500 company, multinational uh, telecommunications company. And, you know, my boss told me, please stay, stay three, four, four more weeks. So arrogant, I thought I could do whatever I wanted, and I left. And I broke that bridge. Thank God I was able to repair it later. They, they actually became my clients three, four years after I started my business. But I will never forget that lesson. I hurt a lot of people by thinking that I was indispensable. Yeah. You know, and for me, waiting three, four more weeks, you know, it would have been okay. I didn't have to rush into the other. So people always comes first. You know, one of my developers, 28 years old, brilliant kid, he died from cancer two weeks ago. Just like that. Yeah. And what he remembered is relationships. What he remembered when I was talking with him, when I was sharing the gospel with him, he said, you know, it's this company. It's our family. Yeah. And that's why I tell my people, this is a family. We go beyond, above and beyond. When COVID hit, I started making motivational videos for them. I have people in nine countries, so you know I have to use different ways to communicate. And you know why? Because I do consider them my family. Now that we're in trouble, it's funny because I told them like in September I, I, I had a town hall meeting. I told everybody start making start making preparations to have three months of food in your house, just in case because flu season comes. We don't know if they're gonna lock us down. And look look at it now, right? Big problems in the Middle East. Uh, it turns like it feels like there is going to be a third world war or something like that. All the countries are fighting with each other, and they're paying attention. But why did I tell them that? They're just, you know, they're technology people doing great things for my clients. But I appreciate them as well. Yes. Because I know that at the end of the day, that's what matters. Like you said. Yeah, right? absolutely. What's in the future for you? So. I am continuing to work with clients and this is as far as what I see at the moment, this is the future to continue to help companies who are looking at their technology team and saying, hey, we're not getting the value that we think we should. And we kind of come in and we look at the people side, we look at how processes are done, we look at what's happening with the investment in products and partnerships with software and vendors, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that you're getting the ROI out of your technology and that's far more than just the bits and bytes that's also out of the team right that the team is engaged and that they're delivering and so we're going to continue working with companies who are struggling and so many are looking at digital transformation or other buzzwords and it's really not about the buzzword it's about building a true high functioning technology organization that can deliver value for the business and when you create that alignment it does such wonders for an organization Beautiful. Now I know why my team selected you to be in this podcast. Uh, this, we, if we had more companies like yours, we would have a much better economy. Thank you for your work. <laughs> you. Daniel, what has been the worst problem in your life, personal or business-wise? And how do you came out? The worst problem? Yeah. So, life is always a journey of struggles. There, there's all kinds of struggles that you go through. Um, the, the most difficult challenge that I guess that I could say that we've ever faced, um, business challenges are typically temporal, right? They're, they're smaller, they're on the side, um, you know, that business will come and go. But, you know, one of the things that I will say has transformed my family the most, um, was the fact that I have uh, a daughter, uh, she's our youngest. It was born with a heart defect and Down syndrome. We were not aware of that uh, before she was born. And that was one of the darkest time periods to go through, not knowing what would happen and the future of it. Um, and that has turned into one of the greatest I'll say aspects of my family, but one of the greatest dimensions to our family is the fact to see her siblings who are older, you know, engage with her, to see her develop, to see her continue to um, engage and to see the way she sees the world, which is just completely unique. And really to see, you know, she's 
um, I guess, seven now. And to see what the beauty has been through that, um, you know, obviously that was a time of crisis and you, you, you have so many unknowns, um, but to walk through that and see what happens. And she's built even relationships into our friends and others that she's just, she's pulled everybody together. Um, and again, we were in the hospital not knowing what was gonna happen, so. That's beautiful. And that's a true example of how your biggest progress become the stepping stones to your biggest achievements, isn't it? Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Nathaniel. Yeah. The time is going by so fast, and I, I know I could be speaking with you for the rest of the day, and you have so much wisdom. And you look like you are 32 years old, by the way, so I don't know where you're getting all this knowledge from. <laughs> if, uh, if you had a struggling leader, uh, maybe he has an underperforming employee that is not doing their job, what would you recommend this leader to, do to help motivate that person? So if you've got an underperforming employee, um, the first conversation is to make sure there's enough trust between you and that individual to have a real discussion. And in the event that there's not, then depending on what the time is and how much time you have to invest in this, maybe there's another leader you need to bring in who has a strong relationship. But we've got to get to a position of trust first uh, or else the conversation we can't open up, right? Uh, and some of that is being vulnerable, sharing your own struggles, as you've kind of alluded through here, we've talked about challenges and hurdles through life, but building that relationship. And then when you get there, you need to understand the why. Um, is this a temporary thing? Is this someone who is succeeding and now is struggling? Do they have something going on in their personal life that um, you know they're dealing with a family member who is ill or they're dealing with some type of unforeseen financial struggle or they're just, their children are fixing to go to college and they're trying to figure out all of these changes in life. There are a lot of different things that can affect people. And as a leader, understanding that the same situation is going to affect individuals individually. So you may have someone on your team who is having a similar life experience and they're fine. So you can't look at this individual who's struggling and saying, well, their problem, they should just deal with it. You've got to understand why it's impacting them and walk through it with them. If it's a situation where it's motivation and so you're saying okay everything's good and they're just they're not motivated then we've got to understand what motivates them some people are motivated by they want to make an impact and so this individual may feel like the work they're doing isn't making an impact and you've got to explain to them how what they're doing to, is tied to the team's mission and is tied to the business goal you know there there's a lot of uh, we talk about three levels of clarity so the business has to know why they exist the team has to know what they're doing for the business and an individual has to understand what their role is. And just because they have a job description does not mean they understand what their role is. So it may be a clarity issue. It might be that they have conflict with somebody internally. So really, there's no one answer. It's really about sitting down and understanding and as a leader, digging in, doing the difficult work to really, it's not fun, but it's rewarding and understanding what the drivers are and what the uh, roadblocks might be, and then systematically working on it. It might be that, and I had this situation happen where I was working with an employee and they were really not showing the, the value to the business. When I sat down and had the conversation, it was because they were using one set of tech skills and they really, really wanted to use a different set. And I had to say, look, we don't need that other tech set. Like, it just doesn't apply. So I wanna help you I will help you get in contact with recruiters. I will help you with referrals. I will help you. But if you really want to do this, you're never going to be happy if I've got you over here doing something else. Yeah. So I had to help them as a human, even though it hurt me as a team member, right? To say, okay, I'm going to have to hire and backfill. It was better for them to help them find another role that met their passion in tech. So really understanding that as a leader is the number one priority. Wow. You said it so well, because by you, by you holding them back, you're making a disservice to you and, and to the person too. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, Natalia. Thank you so much. We're out of time. Oh boy, I had 10 more questions to ask you. Uh, one last question, I want to respect your time. If you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on earth, what would you write? 
if I had access to a billboard on the busiest highway? It's a great question. Um, you want to make it succinct. So I would probably put on it a handful of words. Life is short. Relationships matter. Choose wisely. Life is short. Relationships matter. Choose wisely. That's so well said. I don't even think it requires an explanation. It's so plain. And if people actually follow your advice, they will be much happier in this short life that we get to live, right? Uh, brother, thank you so much for your time. If people would like to get your services, uh, if people would like to find out more about you or, or just ask you more questions, where, where can they find you? Absolutely. So eqdigital.com, you can contact us there, or uh, I'm on LinkedIn, always putting out leadership materials and other information for business and technical leaders and how to maximize the value of technology. So uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn, Nathaniel Morris, uh, then you'll see all of our content there. I know. Thank you so much for being in the show. You're always welcome back. God bless you and have a beautiful rest of the day. Thanks. Appreciate the opportunity. Have a great day. Cheers. Thank you for tuning in to the Leaders in Tech podcast. Check in next week to keep learning how to use technology and leadership to change the game. See you next time.